Greetings, members, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member here or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all those links can be found down below. Also, if you are new here or you've been here and haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Encounters. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. One evening, about five years ago, I traveled to Loch Ness with a friend to see the loch and the surrounding area. We had planned on arriving by afternoon, spend the evening, then head to the hotel when it got dark. That was perfect. We got there with no problems and spent the day together taking in the beautiful landscape. The moon began to rise and then we decided it was time to head back as we had spent the majority there. As my friend began to drive back, she went around a sharp bend, and I mean the word to its very meaning. She narrowly avoided a man standing at the edge. She was quite understandably in shock and slammed the brakes on in sheer panic. She began to pant, verging on hyperventilation as I tried to calm her. She had believed she hit the man when she swerved. The man was okay, as we later learned because he walked towards the car and apologized for standing so close to the road. After we tried to make small talk with the repeated apologies, he showed me two pictures and I asked if I knew who the people were because he is trying to track them down. It was dark so I switched the light on and quickly glanced, then said I didn't. I showed my friend and she just shook her head without properly looking. She was still in shock. The man didn't ask for the photos back, nor did that conversation go any further. He apologized again and wished us a good night. I joked that we'd be better back at the hotel. He laughed and walked off. We drove on. When we were in the hotel room, I looked at the two pictures more attentively and felt sick to the pit of my stomach. One picture was of me and my friend stood at the water edge overlooking the lock with my arm around her. The picture had been taken from behind. The second picture was of me and my friend walking together, our faces clearly seen. That picture was taken from the side, but it must have been done in a wooded area because you could see tree branches. We both sat for about an hour with the pictures in our fingertips facing us, just speechless. I tried to remember the man, but I couldn't remember any features because of the darkness besides a beard, glasses, and that he was soft-spoken. Later that night, I was awoken by my friend who was screaming frantically. When I ran into the room, she said that a man with glasses was watching her through the window. We packed up and left immediately. I've never been back to Loch Ness since. I have a quick yet frightening story. I'll try not to go overboard with the descriptions and so much profanity, but this is exactly how it played out. I was a kid at the time, maybe eight or nine years old. My family and I decided to go to Swiss Chalet for dinner. My Canadian friends will know what this is, but for the rest of you it's a rotisserie chicken restaurant which was normal for us, so that's not the creepy part. I ended up taking a bathroom break and had to use the only stall in there. When I got done inside, 
Nobody else was there, and I was by my lonesome. A few minutes pass, and another man enters. Older fella, judging from his steps, and I could make out his shoes. They were typical black, boxy-looking dress shoes. As he got inside the bathroom, he was whistling and singing along to the song, playing over the speaker. So far, everything was fine. He went over to one of the two urinals, used it, started washing his hands, and then out of nowhere, he starts swearing, profusely, and what felt like was directed at me, things like, you fucking C-word, I'm not going to say that one, you all, <laughs> you piece of shit, you bastard bitch, etc., etc., which were, by the way, not part of the song playing overhead. Now, I was a very shy kid, so this kind of thing was awful for me. First of all, I'm in a stall by myself, which was already scary enough at that age for me at least. It gets worse if somebody gets inside with me, and then to have this happen is a big no-no. The guy was swearing for what felt like an hour, but was still actually a good like five solid minutes of swearing, I swear. Not to mention, his voice became very hoarse all of a sudden, and when he was swearing, he sounded slightly demonic, but almost like a whisper, so as not to let himself be heard by anyone. I couldn't do anything, and I ended up pulling my feet up towards me to try and hide and prevent myself from crying. I felt helpless, and like I was going to get hurt or something worse. Finally, he stopped and left, only to literally come back in for like a second to say one last, you fucking prick, eat a bag of shit, or something like that. I stayed in the stall for like a good five to ten extra minutes just to make sure he would not come back. I finished and cleaned up as fast as I could and slowly exited the bathroom. I looked left and right before leaving to check and see if anyone was there, and then quickly ran back to my family at the table. I asked my dad if he had entered the bathroom, and he quickly replied no. At first, I actually thought it was him, based on the shoes, but, but my dad's were slightly different, more of a brown, if anything. I quickly told them what had happened clearly pretty distressed and they kind of laughed it off and thought nothing of it. We finished eating and then left. I had a quick glance at the restaurant to see if anything stood out to me, but nothing, or rather nobody, stood out to me. Everything seemed normal. We left the restaurant and it's safe to say I was very scared about going into a bathroom alone again for a good year after that. Thankfully, something like that never happened again. Hey guys, this just happened a few hours ago, and I knew I just had to tell someone about it. So, I am currently at college in Boston and have an apartment in the North End with my buddy. We're both 21. My girlfriend came up for the weekend to visit, and we were doing our normal weekend things, and drinking and just hanging out. My roommate convinced us to watch Green Inferno, because it just made its way to Netflix, and I had been meaning to watch it. Horribly fucked up movie, but pretty good if you like a gruesome horror flick, but don't mind bad acting. Three-fourths of the way through the movie, I kept hearing this banging noise coming from what sounded like inside our building. At first, I ignored it, thinking I was just hearing things, or it was noise from the busy main street that our apartment building is on. But, after a few times, I thought I heard a girl scream. I paused the movie and asked my roommate and girlfriend if they had heard it, and they both did, but we shrugged it off as random kids getting drunk. I heard it twice more, and it wasn't sitting right with me. So I paused it and said to the roommate, let's just take a walk down the stairs and check the halls, huh? 
We left our place on the top fourth floor and headed towards the stairs where we saw a man who looked to be in his late 20s sitting on the stairs outside an apartment. And he looked like he was a mess. We asked him if this was his place and he kind of said yes, but not definitely. And he sounded a little bit drunk. We had no reason to believe him, so we went back to our room, however. Right when we got back, I remembered that the only person that lived in that unit were two or three girls, and my roommate agreed. We decided to head back out there, and at this point, my girlfriend was freaked out. We approached him again, and I asked, Are you sure this is your place? And he stood up and said yeah, and proceeded to aggressively bang on the door multiple times. When he stood up, I immediately noticed the poop stains on his white jeans and pointed it out to my roommate. We are both in-shape guys and realized right away if anything needed to happen, we could easily take this guy. At this point, we both said we think you should leave to the guy because clearly that wasn't his place and he was not at all there. I mean, the dude shit himself. He looked at us, then looked back at the door, where he tried five different keys in the lock. Obviously, none of them worked, so we again firmly told him to leave the building. The whole time, he didn't really argue with us and never gave us firm answers, further proving our point that he was messed up and did not belong here. At this time, something must have clicked in his head, so he started heading down the stairs with us closely in tow, making sure he left while plugging our noses and gagging on the stench of his ship-stained pants. When we were in sight of the landing at the base of the stairs, the sight we saw made our stomachs drop. We saw a phone with earbuds on top of a shelf that sits there, a hoodie strewn across the floor with a mask a few feet away, a satchel-looking bag even further away, and a package that I had seen in the lobby earlier. As soon as I saw this, I thought the absolute worst, as it looked like a struggle had taken place. I immediately asked him in an aggressive tone, What the fuck did you do? and I could tell he was not scared now. He refused to answer me and tried to bang and open the apartment on the first floor now, claiming that this was his place. He then went to collect his things from the floor, and just to be sure, I made him unlock the iPhone in front of us to prove it was his. It was Touch ID, and he opened it. We did not like the way he was acting, so we kept insisting he should leave as he formed answers back that were barely English. After this, he proceeded to walk towards the back of our building in a rather brisk pace. There is a tighter staircase at the back which leads to all floors, as well as an alley out the back of our building. This is probably the strangest part, as very few people know about this exit to our building, but we headed there with speed and confidence. My roommate followed close by to make sure he left, and the back door shut firmly as once it's shut, it cannot be opened from the outside, and I was far back, gagging on the stench. The alley behind our building goes behind a restaurant, then connects to a dirty parking lot that is accessible by the main street in the north end that our buildings face. After this, we went out the front door together and walked around to the back door to make sure this man was completely gone. We slipped a note under the door of the girls saying we saw the man and made him leave and to come knock or text us if they need anything as we wanted to make sure they were okay. Luckily, this man left without any problem occurring between him and my roommate and I as that would definitely have ended in an ugly manner. We knew girls lived there, and this man was giving off terribly creepy and distraught vibes. We aren't oblivious and knew there was a strong chance this man had ill intentions with these girls, so we felt the need to do something. So any creepy man who was terrorizing the girls down the hall, I hope we never see you again, 
If we do, it will not end well. Also, you might want to pick up some adult diapers. Here's a quick update. The girls who lived in the apartment was luckily not home when all of this went down. She ended up texting us so we explained what happened and she was obviously freaked out. She called the landlord who called us to get our story and she believes it could have been an old tenant who was subletting over the summer that constantly got locked out. He would come back drunk and bang on his door and one time actually broke it down. It's hard for me to think this was the same guy as he didn't start banging on the door until after we mentioned we knew a girl lived there. Also, this apartment is a floor above and in a different spot than the one the old tenant used to live in. I got my first job when I was 16 at a Taco Bell, about a seven minute drive from my house. It was a step up from a McDonald's and close enough that if I didn't have a ride, I could tough it out and walk or get an Uber because it would be cheap. I was really shy as hell and didn't talk to anyone but good was a second home. I felt more comfortable, less judged, and opened up into a new person after working there for a short time. After a couple of months, our GM leaves after being hired somewhere else, and we get a new one, his name is Dan, who had been working at another location, was arrested and in prison for a while, got out, still had his manager keys, and just came back to work. They needed a new GM at my store, so they switched him over and promoted him. Okay then. He was kind of weird, but I tried to be nice. I really liked my co-workers, my job, the location, and loved the last GM, so I was trying to make it work with this one. Well, he was a fucking weirdo. He started sleeping in his car in the parking lot overnight. He had a wife and a house, by the way was twitchy and jumpy, had a bad leg he was constantly limping on, and started stealing bags of tortillas, messing up the inventory. He was just obviously a tweaker they hired literally out of prison to come run a store. Ah, great fit. I was over it now. I missed the old GM, and the other managers were 18 to 21 and very bitchy. I'm thinking of leaving, but sort of just riding it out, hoping all these people will eventually be let go. Then, I'm standing at the front counter during a shift. I was assigned to lobby, taking orders, cleaning front of restaurant, bathrooms, restocking stalls, etc. I'm wiping down a fat stack of trays, just zoned out. Dan comes up behind me. So, you're thinking of leaving, huh? We were all pretty much in each other's business, and everyone told everyone anything they heard about the other, so I didn't care he knew and wasn't surprised. I just said, yeah, probably, and I made some excuse about school. Don't really remember what I said, but I do remember what he said next. Well, if you do that, I'm going to have to give you a few drinks and put you in my car. Bro, what? I just side-eyed him like, what the fuck does that mean? Did an uncomfortable laugh and kept wiping. I decided to quit and came back after this creepy asshole was gone. This happened over 10 years ago when I was in my early 20s, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I have only shared this story with my family and a few friends, but this seems pretty comfortable to share with you all. I was living in Japan at the time, so it was pretty normal to see people doing the whole cosplay thing. I'd see people dressed up in characters and dressed differently, but this was something else. I was out with a friend one night having a few drinks, just the usual dinner and booze at an Izakia lounge. Back then, it was pretty normal for me to either walk home or taxi home after midnight since the trains stopped operating at around 12.30 to 1 a.m. This was the case for many people that enjoyed the nightlife. 
it would often be pretty busy in the streets around that time. This particular night, my friend wanted to go clubbing with some of our other friends, but I had a pretty early morning start, so I decided to walk home. I lived about a 25-minute walk from the area we were drinking at. I often took a few shortcuts through some alleyways to get home quicker. As I turned the corner in one alleyway, I was face to face with a guy wearing clown face paint, but more like the Joker. As I mentioned, it was pretty normal for me to see people with cosplay and dressed differently, so I walked past him with a smile and just kept walking. As I passed him, I noticed he had some blood on his clothes, which made me feel a little uncomfortable, but I kept walking. That's when I realized he started following me. I even made some unorthodox turns into different streets to try and get away. I walked faster, but he kept following me. I turned around and asked him if he was okay and if he needed help. That's when he put a big smile on his face and started giggling and pulled out a kitchen knife. I got freaked out, so immediately I turned around and started running away from him. He then burst out in a screaming laugh and started skipping towards me. As I started running fast, he too then started running fast. As I was running away from him, I can still hear him giggling and running towards me. I was running for about three-ish minutes. Then I heard a small construction site with garbage on the side of it. I saw one of those metal rods used in construction and I quickly picked it up and turned around and yelled at him. We both came to a complete stop. He saw me with the metal rod and stopped running. I yelled at him and swung the metal rod around and told him I will hit him if he stepped in closer. That's when he stopped. I started walking backwards to make sure he wasn't following me. After about a block of me walking backwards, he was just standing there. I turned around and started running home. I will never know if he was just trying to scare me or if he was actually a psychopath trying to kill me. Either way, it was one of the creepiest moments that has ever happened to me. I'm sorry if my story is long. I just had to get everything out and off my mind. I went from being a social butterfly in regards to dating to a nearly paranoid hermit. Here's why. I'm 30. I've been on a lot of dates throughout my adulthood, mostly because I enjoy meeting new people and I suppose psychoanalyzing them. That sounds odd, but I did major in psychology for a reason and I just think humans are fascinating. Of course, there are certain criteria. No hardcore drug users, no creeps. I don't want to go out with someone my mom's age. I could go on, but you get it. This has been a positive in many ways. Networking, making new friends, playing matchmaker, gaining insights on dating in general, etc. And sometimes someone surprises me and they are nothing like I had imagined. Maybe their photos were bad or I knew them from work or a formal setting and their personality is markedly different in a casual setting. And honestly, even if it doesn't work out, it's cool when that happens because it reminds me not to judge people and to keep an open mind. So, I've been on bad first dates. So bad that they make awesome stories and when my friends are depressed, these are awesome little tales I can whip out and make people laugh. When I'm down about being single, I even think about these and have a chuckle. This one is my favorite. Once I went out with a recently honorable discharge marine relocated from another state. We got pulled over in a small town for speeding. He was taken to the station in cuffs because of a speeding ticket that wasn't marked as paid where he was from. He had in fact paid it. He later proved this to me because we dated for a short time afterwards. But the cops at the time wouldn't tell me why he was being arrested. We would joke about it all the time later on. 
The cops had to give me a lift back to my car because I couldn't drive his old truck. That was the standard. It was so embarrassing. They gave me a very patriarchal lecture, and he was freaking out because he liked me and thought I would never talk to him again. He had to walk like four miles back to his truck upon release because he refused the cop's offer for a lift. He was a true gentleman, very traditional cowboy type. Stetson hat that came off when he ate, boots and Levi's, white t-shirt and flannel shirt, kind of looked like a young Tom Hardy now that I think of it. Maybe that's why this is my favorite bad first date story. Once we went to a river for a picnic and that same truck got stuck and we had no cell signal. So we had to hoof it through a national forest for miles to be able to call for help. A mountain lion ended up following us. Thankfully, he had a concealed to carry, a very old school looking revolver, and I honestly felt like I was in a western movie or something. He was very protective and knew exactly what to do. Well, it didn't work out because he took another girl to the same spot and got stuck yet again. It was an amazing view though. And someone who helped pull his truck out for the second time contacted me and let me know he was two-timing. In his defense, I sent mixed messages about dating other people and lived a few hours away. And he was probably a little too young for me anyway. Anyhow, thanks for those stories, Marine Cowboy Tom Hardy doppelganger. But that is all kid stuff compared to my central story. I was on a dumb dating app not intending or expecting to go out with anyone from the site because I was happy being single and had just ended a relationship with an emotionally draining person. But as I prefaced, I am very curious about people and open-minded, and that's what came back to bite me. I agreed to go on a date with a guy who I had a lot of shared interests with. Same ethnic background. Romanian, which is rare around where I live. And we even had the same birthday. He was very into astrology and tarot and esoteric topics in general, including mythology and paganism. What stood out to me was that he was also very science-minded, and while being interested in the aforementioned stuff, also kept a rational, agnostic attitude about it and approached it more from an academic perspective than a religious one. I was excited because this is rare where I live, in a very religious town. We actually spoke on the phone before we met, which is something I usually insist on to weed out the weirdos. In hindsight, I realized the first weird thing was after we hung up for the first time. He called me back despite me saying I was going to bed, but I let it go. Maybe he didn't see my text. Fast forward to the first meeting. I asked if he wanted to meet at a very populated local park, and he said yes, but that he wanted to sit by the tennis courts specifically. These are located on the same street, but there are a few houses that separate them from the main park. I thought it was part of the park, but I was wrong. It's actually owned by our local university. This becomes relevant later on. I asked if he was into tennis, and he said, yes. I asked if he wanted to play tennis, and he said he didn't have any equipment. I figured he just wanted to watch people play tennis or something. It stood out, but wasn't a red flag. Yet. I got there before him. I watched people play tennis for a while and thought, Oh, maybe this is why he wanted to meet here. Whoever got here first would be able to watch tennis and not be bored waiting. He spooked me because he snuck up behind me. One second he wasn't there and the next he was introducing himself. I am very observant of my surroundings and kept looking for him because he told me which direction he'd be walking from. This was just down the street from his house, by the way. And to this day, I don't know how he did it. I'm always sneaking up on others, sometimes on purpose because I'm an asshole, and sometimes by accident. So this shook me, and I was discombobulated. I realized his photos were very bad on his profile. He was a very attractive guy in person, 
But in his photos, when he would smile in a selfie, it just looked off. I don't smile much in photos, so I wondered if maybe it was because he was the same, but trying to get past it. Oh my God. I don't smile much in photos, so I wondered if maybe it was because he was the same, but trying to get past it. I don't know how to elaborate any more on that. There was just something distinctively odd about his smile in photos. I didn't notice it in person at all, which made me immediately wonder, when we met, if I was overly judgmental of people's photos? Uh, in hindsight, I'm not. Things start out a little awkward on his part. My style is to just say hi. I'm Flat Little Onion Dome and start talking like we've met before. Most people love this. I love it. No job interview vibes, just two peeps hanging out. But there was something markedly different about him in person. On the phone, he was chitty, chatty, witty, imaginative, seemed to have passion for life. In person, he made fun of people nearby playing tennis because they weren't following the rules and ended up playing some funny, awkward form of tennis volleyball. They were a young teen, so I felt he was just being a real asshole. He was obviously checking out other chicks, not just noticing people come and go. There's a difference. Condescending about nearly everything I talked about. Made some weird comment like he was very frugal. On the phone, he said he had spent too much money on travel and books. And his goal for the month was not to spend money on any beverage. But he was still going to drink coffee. I was like, coffee is a beverage. You're cheating. He got legit mad and said coffee is a necessity. And also, he makes it the night before, so it doesn't count for the day. Wait, what? That makes no logical sense. And who wants stale coffee? He also said he has a very strict diet that he follows because he knows exactly what it will look like coming out. I wasn't following, and he said, you know, when you shit. At this point, I legit wondered if maybe he had some sort of disorder that would affect social interaction. But as someone who is on the spectrum and has friends and family who are, that just didn't feel right. So I thought, oh well, he's just a jerk and probably trying really hard to appear smart and deep, hence his weird comment. I told him I needed to get home to check on my ball python as I own and breed them. Great way to creep out creepy guys. And also, I love them. But not before he told me I had an orange-brown aura. I said that was cool because I love being outside during autumn. He just stared at me blankly. I offered to drive him home. Why, 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 flat little onion dome, did you do that? Face palm. As he had walked, I guess I was kind of nosy about which house was his. I also wanted to show off my car. That's my ego here. He said he was surprised I was a professional and not a waitress or something. He worked at a Fazoli's. Literal two-minute drive, parked in front of his house, and he asked me out for Thursday. It was Monday. My response was I couldn't for obvious reasons. I could tell he was contemplating inviting me in or kissing me goodbye. He asked me how I felt about a goodbye kiss, and I said I had no feeling one way or the other. Again, dumb, as he was very weird. But as he was a good-looking guy, I figured a kiss goodbye for what definitely would be forever wouldn't be horrible. Well, this obviously pissed him off because I was giving him no feedback just to see what would happen. And I think he knew it. And he suddenly started telling me how I looked different than my photos. All of them are recent. No filters. One was a professional headshot. The rest were just snaps from my iPhone. I asked him how so because I was genuinely puzzled. He said he was shocked someone like me. He referred to me as a intellectual previously, 
which I'm not sure was meant as a compliment or an insult, would wear the leggings I had on. They are just plain old leggings with a southwestern print, no crazy colors. I must have not reacted the way he wanted me to because he continued. He also said I looked heavier in person, and he said I was also darker than he thought I was. I am mixed race, ethnicity, Jewish and Native American. And this really pissed me off and made me think he was racist. But I casually said, well, yeah, I've been in the sun the past week and laughed. I also said, that's interesting. <laughs> um, good night. He got out of my car and said, I bid you adieu and not the French kind, but spelled that way. I'm assuming he meant to insult me further by a Freudian implication of not French, as in kissing. Or maybe he was just dumb and I'm reaching. But I replied, if it's spelled that way, it's French. And drove off and promptly bought a milkshake and a huge order of mozzarella sticks on the way home. Asked some dude friends if I did in fact look bigger in person. I'm ashamed that I asked, but... The answer was a resounding no, and fuck that guy. He was just pissed. He didn't get laid. Now I wish the story ended here, but it would be one I could laugh about in hindsight. Kind of. Here's what I mean. But maybe not because I had a nagging feeling about this dude. Something I couldn't pinpoint in my mind's eye. The more I thought about everything in context, his vibe was just so fucking dark during the date at times. Eye contact with no blinking that weirded me out even though I'm usually huge on eye contact. And the negging that was quite cruel. So I googled his name and he is on the sex offender registry for soliciting sex with a 13 year old when he was just 23. He's 38 now for context. If it wasn't bad enough, he broke his probation by pleading guilty to stalking and got sent to jail for 120 days. He was a college student when this happened and the girl was a college student. I'm sure much younger than him. I have access to a few databases and found court documents she was a stranger. He stalked her on a route to school and on campus, even on the bus shuttle. And he got kicked out of university and can't go back on campus ever. I got a message from him the morning after apologizing, and I responded with, no worries, good luck out there, because I did not want this guy to be angry at me for obvious reasons. I reported him to the dating site and his profile got taken down. He contacted me again and said, if you had an issue with me, you could have just told me. And I played dumb. He believed me and vented about it and admitted to be a sex offender. I pretended to be sympathetic and said I had a family member on the registry for peeing outside. This was a lie, but I do have a cousin who almost got in trouble for being outside when we were kids. And then he stopped messaging me. Thank you, God. I usually would have gone no contact, but my town isn't that big, and I did not want this person to have a grudge against me. I did some research, and I found out he couldn't go to the main park because sex offenders aren't allowed to go to the parks with playground equipment. Hence the tennis courts. Also, most people into auras interpret orange as a sexual energy. I think because I don't have revealing photos on dating sites, my big, very non-juvenile boobs probably turned him off since he likes teenage girls and all. Excuse me while I go vomit. I think he's into metaphysical stuff because it's a community that's very open-minded and probably more willing to forgive his charges. The diet thing was probably because he was in a cell with a toilet, and I'm going to assume, in that small of a space, you smell your own body waste, for lack of a classier term, for a long time. 
Can you buy air fresher from commissary? Maybe I should consult Orange is the New Black. Also, the weird social stuff aligns with antisocial personality disorder. More than autism and Asperger's, according to one of my diagnostic psychology books from college. I am traumatized. I couldn't stop thinking about and analyzing this for days on end. Literally one of the most normal, sane conversations I had on the phone pre-date. Well-dressed and groomed, was very young looking for his age. Ew, he did actually have the same birthday as me, according to his registration page. And shouldn't have had any issues finding dates. But I now know why he is single. If you had told me there is a sex offender messaging you, I would have guessed other people as a possibility over this guy. So I bought a background check membership and refused to ever meet up with anyone from the internet without doing one. Not that face-to-face -face dating during a pandemic is what I want to do, but even talking on Skype, I still want to know. Paranoid? Yes. Peace of mind? Yes. Thankfully, he does not know where I live or my full name, and I had installed Ring security system in my home. The day he started talking to me, and I had mentioned it casually. Long story short, talked to someone online I thought was cool. We talked on the phone and he sounded extremely normal and really groovy. Met in person, totally different vibe, totally thrown off. Had a nagging feeling and googled him, and he was a sex offender and a stalker who had served time in prison. I told the dating site and they removed his profile. I must have been the only one who went out with him recently because he knew it was me. And I convinced him it wasn't because I was afraid of him. Now, go back and read or reread my funny date story. I want to believe that there are more marine cowboys out there than registered sex offender creeps who make and drink coffee incorrectly and are actively online, scouting for gullible women. Stay careful out there, girls, and always make sure to carry some form of protection, pepper spray, taser, whatever it is you have to do, and always call the police should you have more than two red flags. First of all, I would like to apologize for any mistakes I make. English is not my first language. This happened a couple of years ago and when I was 15. I was in Naples, Italy with my friend. I go there a couple of times a year since my close family lives there as well. But it was the first time I'd ever gone there, only with a female friend of mine, Gabby. Prior to this trip, I was always occupied either by my parents, my brother, or a male friend. Since I was practically raised in Naples, I knew the city very well. It was Gabby's first time in England, so I wanted to show her everything interesting. We went out every day. Immediately, I started noticing that every day, guys would come up to us and make small talk. It felt weird, but we shrugged it off, thinking it was because we were young women, not Italian-looking girls with crazy hair and styles. There were countless weird encounters throughout our whole stay in Italy, but in this case, I want to focus on only one of them. Naples is a city that never sleeps, especially during the summer holidays. Adding the fact I knew the city very well, my family members we were staying with didn't object to us going out in the middle of the night. I decided to take Gabby to a walkway overlooking the sea. The street next to it was full of restaurants and bars. We decided to sit down on a short wall that cut off the sidewalk from the benches. We sat there for a while just talking and enjoying the view. Once we turned back to the sidewalk, ready to go home, we saw two people approaching us. 
One was a teenager around our age, and the other one was a gross-looking man in his 50s. The teenager was silent the entire time, but the man spoke just after staring at us for way too long. Since my friend doesn't know Italian, I was the one who had to talk to the guy. First, he asked me what age we were. I said we were both 15. I said it in a tone that normally would make him just leave, since we were clearly underage. But, to my surprise, he kept going. He asked if we wanted to go out for a drink. I reminded him that we were both too young for that, to which he replied with another question, asking if we wanted to go to his hotel room around the corner to smoke weed. That was when I freaked out. Clearly, he was trying to lure us somewhere, but managed to only get us even more grossed out. I once again refused, this time more sharply, and said that we really needed to get home, because I told my aunt I would be back by a certain time. We stood up and said goodbye. When I was about to turn around, the guy grabbed my arm looked at me and said that he just wanted to teach him how to speak better Italian. He gestured to the teenager. I'm also creeped out that he didn't call him his son or friend or nothing, just him. Then we walked away. I took the longer way home on purpose just to make sure he wouldn't follow us. I still don't know what happened back then. First of all, why didn't he back up after I told him I was underage? Second of all, why would he come up to us in order to teach the boy Italian? Since one of us looks Italian at all, and you can clearly see we were tourists. And last of all, who was that boy? What was he doing with this man? And what would have happened if he came up to anyone else? Maybe someone drunk, willing to go somewhere with them? After this happened, me and my friend started being way more careful while being approached by an older man. We just immediately said, sorry, no Italian, which usually made them go away since they didn't want to struggle with speaking in English. Anyway, now, I feel way safer walking around Naples with my parents or a guy I know because no one ever approached me while being accompanied by someone with these features. I have way more similar stories from the same time, but I decided to write this one as my first one, since I don't even know if anyone is going to listen to it. I've been reading a lot of others' stories dealing with creepy encounters, so I figured it's time to write one of my own. I've had a lot of them. I'm a server and bartender, by the way. A few years back, before I started dating my fiance, I worked at IHOP. We had a newer manager, and she was awesome. She almost felt like a big sister. We had this table of semi-regulars, two guys old enough to be my dad. One started hitting on me and asking my manager about me. At this point, I'd been single for a while, and she told him to ask me out himself. She meant no harm. So, I mean, I guess he was all right. Attractive enough for his age. He asked me out, and to be polite, I said he could just leave his number. I felt uncomfortable, but didn't think much of it. The next weekend they came in and requested my section. I was busy and mostly just went about my business. He asked me a few times why I never called him and I kept responding that I was busy with two jobs and my young daughter. The next week he comes in yet again and requests my section, asking why I never called. So I told him once again that I had been busy. I was starting to feel very uncomfortable and irritated. So I ignored them that day until it was time for the check. They paid and I thought I had seen the last of him that day. I went over and started talking to my coworkers. 
All of a sudden, I felt arms around my waist from behind. And before I could react, he fucking kissed the side of my face. Yep, told me he'd see me soon and left me standing in shock. He came in the next weekend and asked to sit in my section again. I panicked. It's probably worth noting I'm a victim of domestic violence from a previous relationship, which made the situation worse. I don't like people touching me, especially people I don't know. I told my boss I could not take that table and why. He kicked them out and told them to never come back. The creeper flipped me off on the way out. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy encounters. I do apologize for it being 10 minutes short, but I've got a bigger project coming your way. I'd like to take a moment and acknowledge and say thank you to the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mee, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank each and every one of you that helped support Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. I hope you have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.